Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Lutheran Church, you online and here in the sanctuary. It is good to see everyone this morning as we uh, worship our God uh, in this place. As we uh, begin our worship, I do have one quick announcement. Um, we had uh, our normal taber, table taker downers downstairs uh, were unable to make it. And so if uh, I could get a couple of strong hands to uh, help us put some, a couple of tables and some chairs away downstairs, and uh, also out in the trailer, um, I can show you where that is. But uh, after the service, if we've got uh, couple of strong hands that would be be helpful to all of us as we get ready for the school week next week. Let us uh, rise now as we begin our worship this morning remembering that we are baptized children of God. We are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. We shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the Lord God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. We take a moment now to reflect on those times when we have fallen short 
of God's word this week as we prepare to receive his forgiveness. Let us humble ourselves before God, confess our sins to him, and ask his gracious forgiveness for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We now confess to you, God Almighty, before the whole company of heaven and before one another, that we are sinful human beings by nature and by deed. We have not always put God first. We have used his holy name in ways that do not honor him. We have not always been devoted to the Lord and have not fully cherished the sacred writings of our faith. We have failed in ways of keeping our thoughts, words, and deeds pure and honorable. At times we have taken what is not ours and have spoken that which is not helpful or true. We have broken the law of God by coveting that which is not rightfully ours and have not put the best impression on all things spoken. We pray our God to have mercy on us and forgive us all our sins and to bring us to everlasting life. The almighty and merciful God grants us all pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you call us to be faithful in very little in order to be trusted with much. Preserve us by your perpetual mercy. Because without you, we cannot but fall. Keep us from all things hurtful and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated now, and I invite uh, children to come forward for a children's message. All right, good to see you guys. And if you can't see me, well, you can come closer. Oh, hey, Lily. You're going to sit, sit up there? All right, good deal. Well, I tell you what, I had a problem a couple days ago because I dropped my favorite water glass and broke it. And when it was broken, I said, well, I'm going to try to fix it. So I tried tape. Didn't work. I tried some glue that I had, but that didn't work. And so I was getting ready to just throw it away, get rid of it, because it wasn't any good to me anymore. But then my wife gave me some of her special crazy glue. You guys know what crazy glue is? How many of you guys have used crazy glue before? Never? You have never glued your fingers together with crazy glue yet. Wow. Okay, well, don't do it. Okay, a little safety tip. It's really sticky. So anyway, because my wife helped me out with her glue, I was able to fix my cup. Now it's still, it's not perfect. It's still got a chip in it, but I can use my cup still and uh, because she helped me fix it. I didn't have to throw it away and get rid of it. Well, you know, in our lives, we have a lot of things that break and we try to fix them, don't we? Have you guys ever ripped a page out of a book? When you're reading it? Yeah. You done that, William? Yeah. How did you fix it? You didn't? Who fixed it? Did anybody fix it? Oh, your teacher fixed it. Yeah, she probably put some tape on it or something. Taped it back together again. Yeah. So it wasn't perfect, but at least you could still read, right? Read the book and see the pictures. Yeah. Or when you break something, if you glue it back together, it's not perfect, but it still works. Sometimes, though, we break other things that are harder to fix. Like maybe we have a friendship and we get in a fight with someone. We argue with them or we do something mean to them or they do something mean to us. And then our friendship breaks, right? And when that happens, that's, it's called sin that breaks those friendships. And it is really hard to put those friendships back together again. Well, in our Bible today, uh, Bible as the Gospel, we're going to hear a very interesting story about a dishonest servant who has an interesting way of trying to fix a problem that's affecting him. This guy had a lot of had some money. He had a boss that he managed his wealth for, and the boss would give him responsibility to manage his wealth, manage his money. Well, this guy was dishonest, though, and he started taking things that weren't his. And what do we call that when people take stuff that's not theirs? Yes, Sadie says stealing. Yep, that's called stealing, and stealing is a sin. And when this guy figures out what's wrong with uh, what's going on, or his boss figures out what's going on, he is going to get fired. He's going to lose his job, which is a good thing for him because he could have been fired and thrown in jail. But the boss has mercy. He's generous, and he says, you know what, I'm just going to fire you. Well, this guy decides that he's got to try to figure out a way out of his trouble. So he tries all kinds of his own ways, thinks about it, he goes, well, I, I could dig, my, dig for a living. No, I'm not strong enough. I could beg. Uh, I, I, I can't do that. I don't know what to do. I'm doomed. But you know what? He then remembers his boss, who is generous and merciful. And so what he does is he uses the resources that his boss gives him to make himself look good in his neighbor's eyes and in his, his boss's eyes. And his boss, you know what his boss does? His boss forgives him. He still fires him. He still loses his job. But the boss forgives him. Well, when the boss forgives him, he's still broken because he still doesn't have a job. But there is somebody that can fix everything perfect when we sin. 
And who is that person? Who do you think that person is? Jesus. Good job, Nathan. Yeah, Jesus. Jesus, he died on the cross to pay for our sins. And when he died, he gives us the gift of forgiveness. And when he, God forgives us, he doesn't just, you know, put a little tape on it. He doesn't just glue us back together again. You know what he does? In our baptisms, we are made brand new all over again. Every time we ask God for forgiveness. And we ask God for forgiveness every time we come into worship. And you may have heard uh, this words from John before. God's word says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's so great that God cleans us and puts us back together, not just with tape or glue, but makes us whole again. He loves us so much that he, rest, he fixes us. He doesn't just throw us away. He fixes us and makes us his own once again. And that is just a great thing that God does for us. Each and every time we do something bad and confess our sins, we're made better again by God. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for sending Jesus to fix our brokenness. And we ask you to help us use this gift to help others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Day after Pentecost comes from Amos chapter 8, verses 4 through 7. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we, will make, that we may make an ephah small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances? that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. This is the word of the Lord. Thank the epistle reading comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, We rise for the gospel. gospel this morning comes from St. Luke's gospel, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus also said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management. 
for you can no longer be my manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. Ah, I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from the management, people may receive me into their house. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. And then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. But when you have not been faithful in the righteous, unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. Having heard God's word, let us now confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father of Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <clears throat> Let me. 
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, what am I holding in my hand? And for those of you that can't see my hand, there is a picture on the screen of what I am holding. It is a hose sprayer, right? Yeah. And what is the purpose of a hose sprayer? To spray water. Exactly. Depending on how I configure it, this is kind of a cool one. It's got a shower on there, which puts out a nice gentle stream of water that I can water delicate flowers with. But it's also got this thing called full jet, which I can use to get really dirty things clean. But the hose sprayer itself really does nothing other than allow water to pass through it. It does not supply the water to do the work that it's supposed to do. It simply distributes it where it's needed and in the way it's needed. It's the user that controls the supply. Well, when it comes to you and me, I would like you to kind of keep in mind this little hose sprayer as we listen to this strange, confusing, difficult to understand parable that Jesus tells us today, the parable of the dishonest manager. It is a parable that pastors, myself included, dread when it comes up every three years because it is difficult to understand, difficult to explain, but it makes us think. What is Jesus trying to tell us here? Because I'll be honest with you, ever since I was a little kid, I always thought cheaters never prosper. Yet, when we hear this parable, at first glance, it would appear that Jesus would disagree with that little aphorism. Because he closes the parable saying, and the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. In situations like this where what Jesus is saying just seems a little confusing, I have a couple of things that I like to try. But even those don't work. Trying to understand the context of the parable. Trying to understand the language of the parable. It, it really doesn't help because the language is there. It is what it is. The cheating guy is commended. So what gives? Well, Bible scholar John MacArthur notes that Jesus tells a little, around 40 parables in all the different Gospels when you add them all up. And a third of those parables have to deal with money. Jesus speaks of riches, wealth, money, whatever you want to call it. He emphasizes it so often because he knows that money is one of those things that could become a potential pitfall to his children. Now, I think we all know why wealth in any of its forms can be a little dangerous. But it is not the wealth itself that's the trouble. By itself, wealth, the third T in the proverbial list of God's gifts of time, talent, and treasure, really doesn't do anything. These are the tools that God has given us to serve him, to serve our neighbors. The problem gets to be when we begin to trust our treasure, putting it ahead of the one who provides it, God himself. The trouble happens when we fashion our treasure into a remarkably persuasive false god. Like any idol that we create, it is a created thing. It is an inanimate object. It is incapable of doing anything on its own. It's only when we animate it with our own imaginations that it begins to cause trouble. Until we decide what to do with it, where to direct it, 
treasure just sits there doing nothing. But when we find ourselves in a difficult time, that's when we can begin to imagine that our treasure will ride to our rescue. That's when we might imagine that our treasure can provide things to us. The necessities of life, security, and comfort. We can begin to think that our treasure will come and save us. And we begin to start hearing it, whispering in our ears. Listen to me. I can give you whatever you want. Fun times? Go ahead. Splurge on that extra deluxe cable package or yet another streaming service. Healing? Oh, I can help you there. I can buy the best medicine in the world for you. A secure retirement? Ah, oh, I got you covered. Restaurants, vacations, that little retirement village that you've been dying to live in? Go out, get it for you. You know, I can even make it make you feel like you're making a big difference in the world. As you make that online donation to the to the animal rescue, the disaster relief fund, or even the church charity. I'll get you what you want. Until it doesn't. And then our treasure shows shows us what it truly is. Just another false god. Unable to love us. Unable to care for us. Unable to stand with us to the very end. Unable to even care for itself. Which is why we hire money managers to take care of our money. In Jesus' day, these money managers represented their master's interests in to those master's debtors. Often, people would lease the master's land in exchange for giving back a portion of the proceeds from the farm or the plot. They'd give back some of the wheat. They'd give back some of the oil, as our story says today. Well, this money manager had been making a pretty good living off the master's debtors, using the master's resources and the master's reputation. He might even have been adding a little extra for himself by padding the invoices a bit. Somehow, someway, it's the master who finds out and becomes a little wise to the, to the manager's scheme. Doesn't say how he did it, but I can imagine it may have went like this. The manager squeezed a little too hard on a couple of the master's debtors. And so perhaps they called the master to, to cancel their, their contract with him, saying, you know what? You're getting a little too rich for my blood. And when they showed him the bill, the master, his eyes popped out of his head. Whoa, that's not what I've been getting from my, my manager from you. I've been getting a lot less than that. Something's rotten in Palestine. And the culprit for the awful smell is the dishonest manager. And so the manager finds himself out of a job. He'd been given the old pink slip. But at least the master showed mercy, generosity to him, because he could have thrown him in jail for stealing. He could have done even worse to him. But he had given the manager a chance to make a new life somewhere else. The reality, though, that the gravy train had ceased caused the manager's mind to begin spinning. How am I going to pull myself out of this hole? I can't dig. I can't beg. I'm doomed. Well, and the manager was right. First, there was nothing he could do to get himself out of his trouble. 
He was the one who cooked the books. He was the one who took from his master. He is the one who deceived the clients. And the consequence of his sin, he lost his job. There was nothing he could do that could fix the situation. But then he remembered something. And it just might work. So he decided to give it a shot. His master, he was a merciful and generous man. He was loved by the entire village. Maybe, maybe he could help me out. The man knew he'd done wrong. He knew that he'd been embezzling, stealing, skimming money off the top. But he also knew that his master was merciful, not just to him, but to everyone. So he would distribute the master's mercy, his love, his provision to others, gaining their favor along the way. Trusting the master's mercy before anyone knew what had happened to him, he went to the people to solve his problem by quickly forgiving a portion of their debts. 50% to one, 20% to another. All in all, he forgave over a year and a half's worth or more of debt to these people. Huge discounts. The manager couldn't save himself, but having faith in his master's resources and his reputation of mercy the manager relied on him to secure his future. And the master, true to his merciful character, accepted the new accounting, showing his mercy toward both the dishonest manager, but also to the debtors. And he praises the manager's cleverness for using his resources, his provision, to secure his own future and bolster his own reputation among those in the village in the process. With this parable, Jesus uses a Hebrew technique of teaching called from the lesser to the greater. In essence, he says, if this earthly master shows this extravagant mercy to this dishonest manager, a deceitful sinner, how much more mercy will your Father in heaven show you as we misuse his bountiful provision that he's given to us? Jesus teaches his disciples, including you and I, that our Father in heaven has given us everything we have, time, that we live, our talents, skills, and abilities, and our treasures. Whether it is much or just a little, he has given us these gifts to manage on his behalf. He has given us these gifts to be used to serve him and him alone by distributing these gifts from him to others in the world, however they might need it, as we trust him to continue providing for our needs too. But Jesus warns us, no servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus knows that at times we serve the idol of our wealth, misusing it for our own selfish desires. He knows that we have a tendency to cling tightly to what little we have, doubting that God will continue to provide for our needs. Yet despite that, 
our Father still has mercy on us as we humbly turn to Him, confess our sin. He forgives us on account of Jesus' death on a cross where He paid the full price for our sins. He forgives us because Jesus paid a price that you and I couldn't possibly pay on our own. And by Jesus' resurrection from the dead three days later, God restores each and every one of us to new and eternal life in his kingdom. We get a glimpse of it now in this place, but one day we will be there in his new creation, just as he promises. But we wait, and while we wait for that glorious day to take place, God calls us to serve him in his world, in his creation. He calls us to distribute the eternal wealth he has given us, the gift of faith received in our baptisms, a gift of faith nourished by his word and sacrament as we also use his worldly gifts. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. So as we go out into the world from this place today, let us remember to daily seek his guidance on how to serve him with all of these gifts that he has blessed us with. Let us spend a little time in devotion and study of his word, hearing what he says to us through that word. Spend a little time in our prayers, listening to what he says to do. Let us allow his provision to us to flow generously from him, through us, and into his creation. Let us allow him to use his abundant love and mercy for others. That it would cleanse the filth of sin from their lives. That it would water the seeds of their faith, causing them to sprout, causing them to grow alongside us, now in this place, and one day in the kingdom of heaven. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. As God's children, he calls us to prayer. And uh, as we come to him in prayer, uh, I did want to make uh, one announcement. Uh, one of our longtime members, Pat Brown, is uh, in the hospital, and uh, she is not doing terribly well uh, right now physically. But spiritually, she is in a great place. Um, she is probably entering her last few days, so we keep her and her family, especially her son Kenny and daughter-in-law Cindy, in our prayers as we uh, pray today and this week to pray for the, the, Be the Brown family. Uh, are there any other prayer needs that we have uh, to give? Today? No? Thank you. Uh, please rise for prayer. This morning, as we, uh, as we pray each petition, please follow along uh, for the Lord's mercy and respond with hear our prayer. And let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy word, even when it makes us uncomfortable and squirm. And thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for lifting us up when we have fallen away from your commands. And thank you for restoring us when we have repented to positions of trust and to the task of proclaiming the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, bless your church throughout the world. Fill it with faithful teachers and preachers of the word, like Pastor Jim. Kindle its worship to be a living flame of praise to you. Make it wise as serpents and as innocent as doves as it bears witness to Jesus. And give it grace to lavish the treasures of your kingdom on anyone who needs them. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we may smile or shudder to hear the parable of the dishonest servant. 
especially at a time of the year when stewardship is often lift, lifted up. Bless this congregation in its stewardship of time, talents, and treasures, and its testimony. Help us to be honest and eager as we use whatever has been entrusted to us for the sake of your kingdom and for the benefit of our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, grant integrity and common sense to our earthly leaders. Make them honest stewards of the power and authority granted to them, for they must give an account of their stewardship to you, their master and king. Be the shield and defender of first responders and those in the military, and use their labors to accomplish your will in the places of chaos and violence. And help us all to have a heart for the poor and, will, and the will to assist them effectively and graciously. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you raise the poor from the dust and care for all who cry out to you. Therefore, with confidence and hope, we remember, we remember before you all those that are afflicted in body, mind, or spirit, especially all those that we're praying for in first notes, all of those traveling this week. And this morning, we lift up Ray, his wife, Carolyn. She recovers in the hospital. We also pray for Pat, Pat Brown and Cindy and Kenny, who are also in the hospital with her. Give, give wisdom and strength to Ray, to Cindy, to Kenny, and all other caretakers in the coming days. We also lift up Gunner, the Sprague's grand, uh, grand, grandchild, who is in the hospital in NICU right now. Um, we pray for strength for them. We now lift up those dearest in our hearts. Lord, bring them out of darkness and into your glorious light and restore them to fellowship with all who love them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Father, receive into your kingdom all who faithfully departed, especially those dearest to us. Keep us steadfast in faith, diligent in service, truthful in word and honest in deed. Bind us together with cords of love and compassion for one another. Bring us with all you whom you've redeemed into the fullness of your presence and give us hearts, minds, and voices to forever adore you and glorify you. Because we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now taught by our Lord, we are bold to pray. Our Father, Amen. who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Have you heard God's word this morning? Uh, and worship through our music, through our attention to that word, and our prayers. We also worship through our eyes and mouth, giving back a portion of what He has given to us. You may be seated. As we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper, let us examine ourselves in accordance with God's Word. 
The Lord's Supper is God's gift for Christians, and God desires that his people receive this gift in faith, believing that it is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. He does not want this gift misused through unbelief in his promise, which results in judgment. This means that as we come together as one body here at the Lord's table, we affirm and confess. I recognize and confess I am a sinner. I repent of my sin and ask God's forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ is my only Lord and Savior, who saves me from sin, Satan, and death. Through faith I receive in the Lord's Supper my risen Savior, Jesus Christ, true body and blood under the form of bread and wine, given and shed for the forgiveness of my sin, the strengthening of my faith, and life everlasting. If this is your confession, I invite you to receive these gifts in faith. If this is not your confession, I invite you to come forward as you are able to receive God's blessing. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right. it is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of eternal life. Therefore, with the angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this as often as you eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
Please rise. As God's children, as we go out into the world to distribute the gifts that God has given us throughout the week to those we meet, those he puts us in, in touch with, we go with his blessing. May the Lord bless you and serve you, keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.
let us joyfully proclaim God's word and enthusiastically share God's love.